go. Right? I right? love that. I I'm love excited. that. I'm excited. Listen, God is so good. He is. How good is he? He is so, so faithful. He is He's faithful. He's more than faithful. Yes. And we're Lord. so thankful that you're here today. Yes. Uh, I'm going to start out like this. Welcome home. Welcome. Welcome home. Listen, we've had an eventful last few weeks here. Yes. And eventful. A very eventful. Full. Full. Emphasis on the full. full. Exactly, exactly. Full of his presence and full of Come all the on. things, right? Yes, yes. And, and I'm loving it. You know, right. um, we're back to uh, our regular services, but yes. I, I don't want to call them regular, regular right. services. No. I want to say powerful services. Yes, amen. Uh, we have an expectation that in our 9 o'clock and our 11 o'clock and our 6 p.m. service, the presence of God amen. will be here with amen. us. Amen. We come with an expectation. I yes. need you to, you all to to raise to raise your expectation, expecting God to do something amazing Amen. in your life today. Amen. God is good, and you're gonna experience the goodness of God today. Yes. Say amen to that. Amen. You know, got me preaching this morning. Mm -hmm. Listen, Mama Nat, you're here this morning. Yes, we are, I am. We know when you come in, you are really coming to share the heart of the house, and uh, we have some stuff coming up this we morning. We have some exciting things in the works. We have Serve My City yes. this month, which Come I on. have just been waiting in anticipation for. Um, you know, Serve My City isn't just a thing where we just scatter seed. Now, mm -hmm. we will do that. Mm -hmm. We will scatter some seed. We'll show up and, you know, we have projects like clean up our city and literally we're going to be picking up the trash mm -hmm. off of our streets. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have some things uh, that are happening where we're already digging wells. Amen. And that's, that's my heart and that's my prayer um, is that we actually dig a little deeper where we're already, already planted. Um, we're going to be doing a project at our women's prison. Let's go. Um, they are walking through a really difficult time right now. Mm. And uh, we were going to go and plant all the plants and do all the things, mm. but we actually are pivoting a little bit and we are going to go full on um, loving on the ladies. Come on. And we're going to do like snow cones and popcorn. Hey. Um, and we're going to give them a special gift and we're going to give them an opportunity to take pictures um, because they will be transitioning. Um, possibly in the next uh, 60 days, uh, wow. which is a very difficult thing mm. for an inmate um, to be walking out. And so we're going to come alongside of them and just remind them that they are the carrier of his presence, Amen. just Amen. like us, and that they're going to carry his presence wherever they are. Yeah, come right? on, Jesus. So, but we have so many more projects. So many more projects. That's a blessing. I can't wait. I'm going to give you a high five. I'm so excited. I'm excited, too. Um, we're going to be a blessing to our community. Yeah. Um, there's a scripture that says, The blessing of the Lord maketh rich and add no sorrow. Amen. And I'm excited about it. Um, Amen. We, we get to actually bring uh, the richness, the riches of this, the kingdom of God right. to our community. Right. Um, and we're, we're believing that God is actually going to use us to be the ones that are going to change the, the region. Our Amen. pastor has been talking about the region being taken over, Amen. and that's through us. Right? Amen. And, and I'm excited about Amen. what we're going to be doing. Now, Now the youth, we're going to be over right? here across the street. They got their own project. Come on. Listen. They're going to be loving on our neighbors. We're lo we loving on our neighbors. And listen, all the youth, listen, we're going to have a block party, but that party is to come and really uh, plant the kingdom of God Amen. across the street and then draw the them. The Bible Amen. says entice them so they can come and so the house will be filled. We're believing that God is going to do something spectacular. We're going to host his presence host outside his presence. this come building, outside Spring Hill. Spring Hill everywhere. has their own everywhere. 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 Spring Hill has their own projects. Mm -hmm. It's going to be gonna a amazing. great day. If you have not signed up yet, you need to get online. Nah, okay? Enough. You need to get online right now. to our website on the news and events page mm -hmm. and look for certain my city right and now. click click a project and if you don't know which one to pick email me let me know and i will help you out because there's a it. lot let's do it now uh like i said it's something for everyone uh do that right now uh do us a huge favor right now too share like yes. comment i want to see some more people in the comments right say right. hallelujah i'm drinking coffee right now the spirit of god is going listen Amen. do say something in the comments today we go check them out this week but uh today we want to see you in the comments in the chat and chat it up with us i'll be in there and then today is baptism day yes. so i'm excited about that and preview He's sunday to today change. it's gotta go He's change gonna in a do second some baptisms. <laughs> exactly in a second like for for like two minutes but that being said stand up get your bibles get everything Lean ready in. Let's lean in. We love you, but God loves you more.
campus. Good morning, Life Church Online. It's an exciting day. The Bible says that this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. Can I hear an amen? Hey, listen, we got a lot to rejoice about. We've got individuals who are going to step out of their comfort zones in some cases. They're going to be baptized in water this morning. Water baptism is an outward expression of an inward transformation. 
They're declaring to the world and to their family and friends that Jesus has come into their life and they are no longer the same person. Everything on the inside has changed and now everything on the outside is beginning to change. And so we're gonna celebrate with them. In the early days of Christianity, it was mostly the Jews, obviously, that were getting saved. They were coming to faith in Christ. So what would happen is, they would make this declaration verbally of their faith in Christ. And then when they were baptized, it was done in a very public setting. They didn't have this setting. They were out at rivers, they were at lakes and ponds, anywhere they could find a body of water. And they were declaring to the world, I am now a follower of Jesus Christ. Not in name only, not in language only, but in my lifestyle, I'm gonna be serving Jesus. Now for them, it cost them everything. Their families disowned them, their families disenfranchised, they were considered dead. Many of the families would actually hold a funeral declaring that by that funeral, that family member, that child, that son, that daughter, they're dead to me, they're dead to me. But they're alive in Christ. And so this morning when these individuals step out and they are baptized in water, they're making a public declaration of, of an inward transformation that God has entered their life in a very passionate, very purposeful way. And what we're going to do in support of that is we're going to go back into our praise and worship and we're going to just continue to celebrate the goodness of God and His presence because we believe His presence changes everything. Amen. So come on, let's go back into praise and worship and let's celebrate with that.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, and everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never
just past the words on the screen. That we've been singing it as just something that we know we're supposed to sing because the words are up there. But it's not a declaration from your heart. And I'm gonna encourage us in this moment to just think on how God has sustained you through all the years. How God has sustained every breath that you have. And he's gotten you into this place. And if he's gotten you here, if he's brought you through hell and high water, you know that God is gonna get you through the next thing. You know that the Lord is gonna be with you and he will never forsake you. So church, can we lift our hands all across this sanctuary? And can we begin to give praise and honor and glory to Jesus? Come on, sing that he won't, he won't fail.
I want you to know that the Word of God trumps every word of man. We need to be reminded today that God is great and He's great to be praised. But that same God who is great is the greater one who lives on the inside of us. His Word declares greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, He's greater than discouragement. He's greater than poverty. He's greater than sickness and disease. He's greater than every form of bondage. The God I serve trumps every attempt of the enemy to drag me under when he's trying to put me over. Come on, somebody. Please understand if you're our guest today, either online or in camp on campus, you are not in the middle of a nominal, normal church. We believe in the unscheduled moments with God, the suddenly surprises of God, the holy interruptions where He hits the pause button in our timeline and says, I want a Kairos with you. I want a God moment with you. This is one of those moments. When I was in this room this morning praying, I was pacing back and forth. And this word kept coming up in my heart. I said, no, God, no, that ain't right. You got, you got that one wrong. And he kept saying, bondages, bondages, bondages. And then it hit me. As I had walked into the room, they had all those, those chains and stanchions lined up. And, and you know, chains represent bondages in our lives. Things that constrain us, things that hold us back, things that prohibit us from going where we want to go. Maybe it's fear, but the Bible says God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's family. I don't know what your case may be. You might have come in here this morning wanting in your mind to give God praise, but in your heart you're going, oh, this is so hard because of what I'm walking through, what's holding me back. The Bible says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. And Jesus said, whom the Son says free is free. So his design and desire for our lives is to walk in freedom, not in bondage. To man or to any manipulative thing. So I want us to go back into the declaration of that song, because that really is a prophetic declaration. Great is the Lord. When you open your mouth and from your heart, you begin to sing passionately and declare passionately, great is the Lord. I want you to understand that all of heaven's angelic armies are coming to bear on the bondage that you are facing in your life. You can walk out of this place free because you've been in an environment where the presence of God will set you free. So we're going to sing that song. I'm going to step off, step back, pray, and then we're going to go into the Word. But I don't want to go into the Word until you can say in your heart of hearts, I'm ready for what God wants to do in my life. Go ahead. On the earth,
Father, this morning, as David did, I will declare the decree, the word that you've spoken to me today. So I declare, great is the Lord. Father, I declare you greater than any form of bondage that may seemingly attach itself to our lives. I declare, I declare fullness of joy as a result of being in your presence today. I declare strength today because we know that the joy that you provide is our strength. So Father, today we make a faith-filled declaration we shout for the spiritual airwaves to absorb that great is the Lord and he's greatly to be praised in every situation, in every set of circumstances. We declare you victorious over it all in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. If you're in the white room, put your hands together. If you're online, put your hands together. Clap your hands all you people and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Thank you, team. I'll ask you to go ahead and take your seat. Are you ready for God to do something super in your life? Amen. Well, welcome to Life Church. If this is your first time with us today, I said this earlier and I mean it very, very uh, unashamedly. Uh, we do not want to be a normal church. We, we have purpose that we're not going to be normal, we're not going to be nominal. If we're going to come in here and invest, you know, an hour and 15 minutes or so, we're going to make sure that we get a return on investment. Every businessman knows if he's going to make an investment, he's going to get an ROI, return on in. I'm going to try to preach to somebody today other than myself, okay? Tonight, would you shout tonight? Our, I'm going to preach a message tonight called Our Brokenness attracts his presence. Our brokenness attracts his presence. So if there's any measure of brokenness in any area of your life, I strongly encourage you and admonish you to be in room tonight or online tonight because I really believe that as we begin to just put these things before the Lord, God's gonna show up and God's gonna do some really great things in our lives. So I just want you to know we are gonna unashamedly in an undignified, necessary, undone fashion, we're gonna worship God. And when he shows up, he shows off. Amen? All right, now... A new theme that I'm going to begin today that's going to carry us uh, through various aspects of the month, um, it will further support our statement that um, we want to be a church that hosts the manifest tangible presence of God. In other words, when you come in, you sense him, not just me. You hear him, not just me, all right? He touches your life, not me. We want to be a church that hosts the presence of God because we truly believe that his presence changes everything. Our latest theme of teaching begins this morning. It's called Altars, Wells, Encounters. We're going to talk about rebuilding the altar. We're going to talk about redigging the well, and we're going to talk about revisiting the encounters. It's all about the re. So beginning to this morning, we're going to talk about returning to the, to, the re, to the rebuilding of the altars in our lives. Now, as I start this off, I want you to understand we're going to talk a little bit about prayer in the middle of all this because prayer is an aspect of, of the altar. Beginning on Sunday night, May the 15th, we're going to return to a, an old schedule of service, an old uh, patterns, if I could use that, to, of pre-service prayer time. Okay, uh, on Sunday nights, we will open the what we're going to call the prayer room. It's WC1, WC2 over to my left, your right. And we're going to open that up for, for pre-service prayer. You can come in for five minutes or 50 minutes. It's up to you. But we're going to just continue to pound heaven's door, okay? And believe that God's going to show up and show off. Now, there are so many prophetic voices around the world that have been telling us that we are at the threshold of a move of God that my generation calls revival. I use the term prophetic voice because a, a prophetic voice has a prophetic eye and a prophetic ear and a prophetic heart, meaning sees into the future in the spirit realm and then begins to call that into place in the natural realm. And these prophetic voices around the world, if you're listening, these men and women are telling us that we are on the threshold of a massive, mighty move of God. 
They're telling us that we're on the verge of a third great awakening, a significant shift, if I could say it that way, in the spirit realm, in the spiritual atmosphere of the church that will arrest the hearts and the lives of men and women, old and young alike, causing them to once again passionately, purposefully pursue the presence of God in their lives because they recognize that our world and their lives need change. And the only place to get that is in the presence of God. It's, it's a major monumental move of God that will attest to the power of God through miracles, signs, and wonders. It will likewise arrest our hearts as it attests to the presence of of God. What is a, a wonder? What is a miracle? It makes you stop and wonder why it's happening when in the natural it should, but it is. Why? Because it's supernatural. What does that mean? It means it goes beyond the natural. We've got, we've been living in the natural for so long, we wouldn't know the supernatural if it showed up. Throughout history, heaven has invaded earth and ushered in an acute awareness that of God's presence that changes lives, changes churches, changes entire cities. This seems to always happen when lethargy and legalism has lured the church to sleep and the nation itself is beginning to implode. I just described to you the condition of the world in which we live. The church is asleep and our world is imploding. Chaos, conflict, confusion all around the globe in the culture. It's when the water table of immorality is high and the water table of spirituality is low. It's as if God steps out of eternity into our dimension called time and startles us out of our slumbering, sleepy state and releases a fire of desire uh, for more of him, a revival, so to speak. Now, quite frankly, and I hold fast to this opinion and this conviction, the only hope for the lukewarm church the only hope for the lukewarm Christian of our day and age is that God will invade and God will interrupt our current contemporary church culture with his presence and with his power. It will be unscheduled. You cannot schedule a revival. You can schedule a group of meetings, but it doesn't mean God's going to show up. I'm talking about where we once again see and experience extraordinary. Let me break that word down for you. Extraordinary, it means extraordinary. Or it goes beyond the ordinary flow of things. Where we experience the extraordinary manifestations of his presence and the extraordinary demonstrations of his power. We must experience this holy, heavenly interruption sooner rather than later. Why do I say that? Because the Titanic has already struck the iceberg. While we were sleeping or when we were playing our song, things have changed. Before we are completely captivated by the allure of this present perverse generation, there must come a cry, a desperate cry, a blood-curdling cry from the remnant church. Now more than ever, it is time for the bride of Christ, the remnant church, to do as the prophet Isaiah himself instructed us to do when he wrote these words. Cry aloud, spare not. What does he mean by spare not? He's saying don't hold anything back. We, we've been so dignified for so long, you can't tell the difference between being dignified and being mortified. Rigor mortis has set into the religious system of our generation. By the way, this is Sunday morning. I know you think it's Sunday night, but it's Sunday morning. He says, cry aloud. Too many people's shouters are broken. We used to have a group of people called the shouting Methodist. We used to have a people called the shouting Baptist. 
We used to have a people called the shouting Lutherans and the shouting Episcopalians and the shouting Catholics. And by the way, even the shouting Pentecostals. But our shouters are either broken or turned off. We forgot. What we, don't let anybody get offended by this. I'm just telling you what I think right now. We have turned our praise God, amen, into. And we don't even know what we're clapping for. He says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions, the house of Jacob their sins. I made this statement a couple Sunday nights ago, and I can't turn loose of it because it won't turn loose of me. Revival preaching is not the same as survival preaching. Galatians chapter 6 says, whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So if we sow survival preaching, then we're going to get a survival mentality. If we sow revival preaching, we're going to get a revival mentality. Revival preaching produces change. Survival preaching produces complacency. We need some men and women who, like John the Baptist, have spent an enormous amount of time out in the wilderness, gaining their voice in the wilderness, and come out saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. I'm talking about men and women in the spirit of Elijah the prophet, who are willing to boldly proclaim to God's people, enough is enough. It's time to draw a line in the sand. It's time to get on board or off board. It's time to get, I'm gonna wake you up with this one. It's, time to, it's either time to get on the pot or get off the pot. Preachers are going to have to once again stand in, in their pulpits in front of their people and begin to proclaim, how long are we going to waver between two opinions? We must change our narrative from sharing our moments, from sharing our memories of yesterday's glory. Begin to speak out of our need for a fresh encounter with God's life-changing presence and power. We must be willing to cry out for and contend for the faith that was once handed down to the early church as recorded in Jude, verse 3, where we read these words. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write you to ex you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Here's how I perceive this. Here's how I want to project this to you and present it to you for your consideration. He's writing to a church where signs and wonders and miracles were everyday experiences, not once in a decade. Where there was a move of God that was consistent and ongoing, not every once in a while. He's talking about a faith. Willing to die for. Because he's writing to a group of people who are, being, who are being martyred for the cause of Christ. We're talking about a faith that changes lives. A faith that raises the dead, that heals the sick and sets the captive free. We need the Elijahs of our day to arise and to awaken the church to our need for God's presence. We've been doing church without God for so long we don't even know it. In some cases, we just need to turn off the lights of the sound system and go home. Because without the presence of God, we are nothing more than just another gathering of people for some reason. Hearing a talk, not a message. Singing a song, not offering worship. Gathering for community, not for relationship. Can somebody say amen and encourage the preacher up in this house? We need the Elijahs of our day to arise and awaken the church to our need for God's presence to be manifested and his power to be demonstrated one more time. It's a place of prayer, praise, and passion. We need to return to the altar. It's non-negotiable, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's a must. We, we must have a move of God. In 1 Kings 18, 21, 
If you have a Bible, turn with me online right now in the room, whatever. I want you to go and listen to the words of the prophet Elijah. It says, and Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you falter? How long will you halt? How long will you sit on the fence? There's only one thing you get from sitting on a fence. It's called splinters. Before, between two opinions, if the Lord is God, follow him. This is a word for the church because he's talking to God's people. If, if, the, if the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal, meaning the God of this world, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Brother Elijah, I know how you feel. You preach truth and it's silent. When the efforts of the religious representatives of that contemporary culture couldn't bring the presence and the power of God into this natural realm, Elijah saw an opportunity. Elijah seized the moment. I declare to you that we are living in an Elijah moment. It says in verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. We're living in that moment, ladies and gentlemen. The altars of America's churches are broken down. They've either been replaced or repurposed. And it's time for us, the remnant, to seize the moment. Here's how that reads in the Amplified Bible. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people approached him. And he repaired and rebuilt the old altar of the Lord that had been torn down by Jezebel. The expanded Bible translation refers to the altar as the remains of a previous altar to God. After Elijah repaired and rebuilt the altar, 1 Kings 18 verse 36 says this to us. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. Then, then, everybody shout then. Understand, Abraham was an altar builder. He built seven altars in his lifetime. And then Isaac was a well digger. But it was Jacob who went back and visited the encounter places of God. So we need to understand that God is speaking to us through his word today. And then it says this, it was after he rebuilt and re rekindled the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the waters that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and now they opened their mouth. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But I want to submit to you this thought today. Before, before the fire could fall, it had to have some place to fall. There had to be a space that had been prepared for the fire to fall. So before the fire could fall, he had to repair the altar. Before the fire could fall, he had to re rebuild the altar. Before the fire could fall, he had to restore the altar. Altars are a place of sacrifice and surrender. Altars are a place of divine encounters. Altars are a place where you encounter the presence of God and you see the power of God. It's a place of prayer. It's a place of praise, and it's a place of passion. Coming up on the screen behind you, you're going to see exactly what it is I'm talking about. We need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the altars of the American church are in disrepair. It's going to take some brave men and women who are willing to swim against the current of contemporary church. Be willing to stand on platforms like I am doing with you this morning and tell you something got to change because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. We will continue to have a lukewarm, mamby-pamby church in America who doesn't know who she is on Monday because she didn't have his presence on Sunday. 
who are willing to say it's time to go back to the altars. It's time to repair the altar. It's time to get back to a place of surrender and sacrifice. It's time to get back to a place where we see the extraordinary manifestations of his presence and the extraordinary demonstrations of his power. Altars have become broken down in America. And they're broken down and they're in need of repair. Rebuilding and restoration due largely to abandonment and apathy. Does anybody in the room have the same memory I have of growing up in church? Anybody here grow up in church? Do you remember those times when, when the way the service was ended was people just being littered in the altars? It didn't matter whether you were Methodist or Baptist or Episcopalian or Lutheran. It didn't matter because the altar was a place you ran to. The altar was a place you clung to. Why? Because you knew that in his presence, in those altars, your life was going to be changed. I promise you, the most significant moments of my life, my spiritual journey, were not sitting in a chair or a pew. My most significant moments in my memory banks regarding my spiritual journey happened in the altars. Where tears, hot, sweaty tears would stream down my face. And I would cry out to God. Did anybody in the room have the experience I had growing up? The church of our day has abandoned the altar largely because of legalism and lethargy. Let me step back and say it like you can know it. Because of complacency, because of carnality, and because of compromise. We wanted to be nominal and we wanted to be normal so nobody would point their fingers at us. The altars of our modern church have been replaced and they've been repurposed. The church of our day must repair, must rebuild, must restore. But there's a fourth step you gotta take with me and that's return. Once the altar is rebuilt, re restored, okay, and, and repaired, we then have to return to the altar that is built on prayer, praise, and passion. If, if we hope to gain a renewed sense of the manifest presence of God and the demonstration of his power that will change our lives, our marriages, and our families. Prayer, praise, and passion are, are pivotal to any significant move of God. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that revival a move of God, as evidenced in the book of Acts, is birthed, built, and bolstered. It is sustained and it is strengthened in the atmosphere of prayer. The Bible tells us in, in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, these all continued with one accord. Everybody shout unity. One accord means unity. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So they got together in a prayer meeting. They united their efforts, and he began to cry out to God. He began to petition God. He began to pray. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Let it settle. Fully come. Bible says in Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time. In other words, when God's ready. But the church has to get ready too. When the when, when, when day of Pentecost was fully come, they're all in one place and in one accord. And suddenly, there was a sound heard from heaven, like as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And then cloven tongues, like as of fire, settled down upon each and every one of their heads. And they all began to speak in tongues, heaven's prayer language, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The great outpouring of God's presence and demonstration of God's power at Pentecost was a result of a prayer meeting. And we wonder why we don't have Pentecost in today's day and age, because the prayer meeting has been replaced just like the altar. You're awful quiet in here this morning. Take your pulse, see if you're still beating. The impartation of Holy Spirit in the book of Acts was not born in a planning meeting. 
It was born in a prayer meeting. Prayer is paramount. Prayer is pivotal. Prayer is priority to any generation seeking to see a significant move of God that my generation calls revival. Because any significant region reaching revival move of God is going to be birthed and built and bolstered and broadened, strengthened and sustained in an atmosphere of united prayer. They gathered in the upper room. They came into unity as they prayed and they petitioned God to pour out his spirit upon them and impart his power to them. What you need to understand in this moment is far more significant than this time frame called Sunday morning church. I'm setting you up for what's going to happen on June the 5th. It's called Pentecost Sunday. So we're going to return to the altar beginning now so that we got some prayer going on. We're going to begin to fast a little bit, you know, those 10 days leading up maybe. And believe God for an outpouring of His Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a modern day move of God. We've got to stop talking about what God did. Let's start talking about what God's going to do. They gathered in this upper room. This monumental move of God was given birth to as a result of unified prayer. They did not plan and project, but rather they came into unity and then they prayed and they petitioned. They cried out to God from a rebuilt altar of prayer. They cried out to God to pour out his Holy Spirit upon their generation. May I remind you today of a promise that is given to us in Joel chapter 2. It's repeated in Acts chapter 2 that in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Stay with me. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And upon my handmaidens and my men servants, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a generation that's coming up in church who do not have spiritual vision because my generation has stopped dreaming. So I'm calling for the Josephs of the room, the dreamers, to begin to dream big dreams because we serve a big God. When I serve, say big dreams, I'm not talking about big buildings. I'm not talking about big agendas. I'm not talking about big budgets. I'm talking about a big move of God that will change a generation. This, ladies and gentlemen, is revival preaching, by the way, not survival preaching. Psalm 133 tells us of the importance of unity. It simply says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he says this, it's like the precious oil. Everybody shout oil. Oil represents Holy Spirit. Oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded his blessing. What is his blessing? Life forevermore. We need God to reveal his presence. We need God to impart his power to this church generation. It's time. Any generation... Any rising remnant that you hear me talk about all the time that wants to see what they saw must do likewise. If we want the power of God to fall and the presence of God to be made manifest, we've got to come into unity and we've got to get into prayer. If we want to see the spiritual water table of this generation rise, if we want to see the spiritual water table of this region rise, if we want to see extraordinary manifestations of God's presence. What do you mean by that, Ed? Things you haven't seen in a long time. Like a whole congregation coming into united agreement that what's being preached, they can't sit in their seat anymore and the whole room stands up. And it causes this guy to shut up because they won't sit down. And they will not be... We have become such a nominal, normal church in America. We just want to come in, take 60 minutes, maybe 75 if you're generous with your time, and then go back out. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not me. If that's what you're looking for, I'll help you find another church because I can name them. (laughs) 
I was texting back and forth with a local pastor today of a local church. I do this on a regular basis with a lot of the younger guys that are coming up in, in pastoral ministry right now. And I told him, by the Spirit of the Lord, I said, you are to raise your level of expectation. I said, don't expect the normal service today. Take your hands off the wheel. I think God's church needs to reflect the Tesla generation. Just saying, let that thing drive itself. We've been in the driver's seat for so long, we've become white knuckled. You mean you went five, over, five minutes over? Yep, 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 yep. The car I drive, if I, tar if I start to change lanes and don't put a turn signal on, it bumps me. God wants us to change lanes every once in a while and maybe go straight from worship into an altar call and then come back and preach and take it off. God help us if we mess with our schedule, you know. If we want to see the extraordinary manifestations of God's presence, truly, ladies and gentlemen, if we want to see just radical demonstrations of his power in our day and time, we're going to have to reap build the altar. We're going to have to repair the altar. We're going to have to restore the altar. But it's not good enough. We then have to return to the altar of prayer, of praise, and of passion. We must, through united prayer and petition, begin to cry out to God for this generation. It's time to rebuild the altar. It's time to return to the altar. Tonight, I'm going to preach about brokenness attracts the presence of God. I'm going to talk to you about one man's experience. His name is Bartimaeus, who had no vision. But he cried out to God from his brokenness. He arrested the presence of Jesus walking along the street. And Jesus gave him what he asked for. When we, like blind Bartimaeus, are willing to acknowledge our deficiencies and begin to cry out to him who is all sufficient, we'll see something happen. So in many ways, this morning is the introduction to tonight's message. So if you're online, don't miss it tonight. If you're on campus in room, don't miss it tonight. I truly believe that we, like the prophetic voices around the world are saying, are on the verge of a modern day move of God. Will we find resistance in the spirit? Oh, absolutely, it's already there. But the angel armies of heaven are our allies. I have zero fear. I have a lot of expectations because I truly believe we're living in a day and time when we've never been more ripe for revival than we are right now. But it requires us to get back to the altar. So if this message resonates in your heart then I'm gonna encourage you to stand to your feet. We're gonna go back into worship. And I'm gonna encourage you right in your seats where you are. You don't have to raise a hand. You don't have to come forward. Right in your seat where you are, you, meet, you need to make a renewed, fresh, deep connection with God, a deep connection and commitment to God to get back into some quiet time on a daily basis. I wonder if we could take an honest survey how many people in the church of our day and age actually spend a little bit of time every day in prayer. Well, I appreciate that one hand clap. I really do. Maybe you've been disconnected from that style of thinking and that idea of having quiet time. For so long, you don't remember what it was like to just sit in his presence and just let his presence wash over you. There are times I go into my prayer time and don't pray. I go into my quiet time and I just like Samuel, speak Lord, your servant listens. Or then there's times where I do what I'm doing right now, I just kinda, and I allow that soaking style of worship to just wash over me. So here's my challenge to you. Here, this, this, this is your takeaway before we go back into worship. Get it, get it, get it, get it ready, get it ready. 
I want to encourage you to make a commitment in this moment to spend five minutes. If you don't have five minutes for God, something's wrong with you. I know people spend more time brushing their teeth. Five minutes. Turn the TV off. Put your phone away. Get out your no back, no book, your iPad or your computer or, or, or your however you connect to YouTube. Just just put on soaking worship. There's a there's a thing called throne room. It's it's it it, it, it there's something that happens in the spirit realm. I'm telling you, I'm just telling you. All of a sudden it will begin to massage your calloused heart. All of a sudden you'll feel oil getting poured over your dry heart. All of a sudden, you'll walk out of those five minutes saying, why can't I spend five more minutes? Why do I have to go to work? Because you want to eat. <laughs> I want to I wanna challenge you, just five minutes. Five minutes every day. And you watch how those five minutes get an ROI like you've never seen. A return on investment. God will begin to move mightily in your life as you give Him your life in prayer. Amen? Come on, let's go into worship. Come on, let's do this.
complacency. And I think the same is for our worship. If our worship is just survival worship, nothing's gonna change. Nothing's gonna change. If we just come in here for our 20 minutes, we lift our hands or we sit in our seats, nothing's gonna change. It's gonna change when our worship turns into revival worship, church. When our worship turns into an overflow and a bubbling up of all that the Lord has done, that's when things are going to change. They're not gonna change when we stick to our schedule. They're not gonna change when we stick to our comfort. They're gonna change when we decide to go from survival to revival. Are you ready, church? Is that what you want today? Is that what you want today? Do you want the presence of the Lord to change everything in your life? Then we have to get serious to get serious about this song. These words cannot just be words on the screen or words that we sing. They have to be our heart cry. So if he is all that you want today, would you lift your hands in full surrender, ready to receive an outpouring from heaven? Come on. Did you hear what Amber said? Let this be the cry of your heart, not just mere words that you repeat from that screen. Church, this, this was a powerful word that is going to set a foundation for where we're going in the days and the weeks to come, amen? And I'm reminded, we're talking about the altar, and I'm reminded that Paul wrote the Roman church in Romans 12, that we, his body, his church, need to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. We wanna talk about worship, church. True worship is when we say, I surrender all. Do in me what you want to do, what needs to happen in me. And church, every time you do that, God is for you. He is not against you. God wants the very best in you. And it takes going back and repairing the altar. It takes subjecting and submitting yourself to him. Amen. Oh, we're on a great path, church. And I look at today's message as just a seed that's been planted in our hearts. That's not just for this service. I challenge you, allow Holy Spirit to water the seed that's been planted in your heart today. Let it grow, let it germinate, let it produce that change that we're talking about. Amen. Oh yeah, we wanna be Jesus out there, don't we? Well, he needs to become more and more preeminent in our lives, in everything that we say, everything that we think, everything that we do. 
all, all of our interactions with people. Amen? Amen. It's been great to be in the house today, hasn't it? Yeah. Now, I do have a couple of announcements, so if you could just be seated so that we can go through some of these. First of all, we always take a moment in our services to focus on our offering. The Bible is clear that the tithe belongs to God. And so on the screen behind me, there are ways that you can give to Life Church, and uh, you can follow those prompts, or if you want to leave your offering in an envelope, you can find those behind your seat and drop it in the receptacle on your way out. But every month, we want to focus on an area that we call heart of the house. Those are our offerings above and beyond the tithe. And so this time, this month, we are going to focus on Serve My City. And if you've not participated in that, if you want to know more about it, turn your attention to the screen for a short video. You know, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3 that we are co-laborers together for the Lord. He watered, Apollo, uh, he planted, Apollos watered, God gives the increase. And we've often said around here, there are many ways to give, not just monetarily. We give our time, our talent, and our treasure. And you just saw on the screens ways that some of our own have been out in the community Community. There's prayer walks, there's, there's projects that we do. So if you want to learn more about where we're going with Serve My City, which is May 14th, so that's coming up real soon, then use the QR code you see on the screen or go out to the lobby out here and you can talk to Nat and she will give you more information about that. Also, if there are any guests in the house today, we want to say a big welcome. Thanks for joining us. We're so delighted that you joined us. And as you came in, you probably saw uh, tents that we have out front. We'd love to get to know you a little bit more and greet you personally. So we invite you to join us in the tent uh, on your way out today. Also, we like to do this periodically. If you've been attending like six months uh, from now till six months, uh, we have a periodic meet and greet. And that gives Ed and myself, as well as other staff members, a chance to welcome you personally, get to know you a little bit better, and likewise, you get to know us some more. And so we invite you, that is going to be tonight, right after our 6 p.m. service. So make sure you uh, take advantage of that and come and join us. We always learn more about some of those who are making Life Church their home, and so that's a great opportunity. Also, coming up this week is the National Day of Prayer on May 5th. And we are going to open up the auditorium from 6 a.m. to noon for those of you who want to come in the auditorium and pray. And also, we gather in the morning at Dade City Courthouse at 8 a.m. for the National Day of Prayer. So we want to give you plenty of opportunities. You heard Pastor just say that, didn't you, about part of building the altar is prayer. And so we invite you to join us in that arena. Speaking of, thank you, Ed. That was an awesome message. Let's honor Pastor today. Let's all stand to our feet as we close out our service. Don't forget our service tonight at 6 o'clock. 
And we always love to end our services in a time of praise. So let's join the team as they take us out. God bless.